Hello everyone, my name is Jess Adamson. I'm honoured to be your host for today's event. And on behalf of the Australian TB Caucus and Results International Australia, I'd like to extend a sincere welcome to each and every one of you. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we are on right across Australia and recognise the First Nations continuing connection to the land, to the water and to culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We have a number of federal parliamentarians joining us this morning, along with distinguished guests from across Australia and the world. Thank you so much for taking the time to mark this important day and in doing so, helping to end TB. This World TB Day, we wanted to bring you a diverse group of voices, including those who've survived TB and who are on the front lines every day, working and supporting people and communities affected by TB. To do this, we'll take you on a journey that spans from Bangladesh to Papua New Guinea and right back to our own backyard in Australia. Finally, I want to acknowledge the organisations doing important work in addressing TB that have provided generous support to make today's event possible. Sincere thanks to the Burnett Institute, Kaijin and the TB Alliance. Please note that we're aiming to conclude this event no later than 9.45 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. And given the large number of fantastic speakers this morning, we won't have any time for any Q&A. It's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker for this morning, Sharon Clayton MP, member from Newcastle and co-chair of the Australian TB Caucus. Sharon has been the federal member for Newcastle since 2013. She's an honours graduate in social anthropology. Before entering parliament, she worked in remote Aboriginal communities and the community-based disability services sector. Sharon is committed to social justice and is passionate about fighting discrimination and ensuring we leave a better world for the next generation. Sharon, it's over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Jess, for that very warm introduction. Um, and I just want to acknowledge I'm joining uh, everybody on World TV Day from uh, Newcastle this morning, so from the traditional lands of the Awabakal people, and uh, acknowledge their um, extraordinary contribution to this part of the world for many, many millennium uh, and recognising their uh, tradition, their um, ongoing contribution to this city. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my co-chair and partner, uh, Warren Ench, over many years, and I know uh, Warren's going to be joining us a little uh, later on to all my parliamentarians. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the extraordinary panel of speakers that are coming up. I can't wait to hear from our peer councillors um, from the Western province, uh, Anaba Kovaku and Millicent Nabi, and um, the Honourable Dr. Habibi Malap from Bangladesh, I understand, is also joining us, the Global Fund's Executive Director, Peter Sands, uh, and grassroots advocate, Maddie Strawn, and, uh, and of course, Results CEO, Ms. Chorley. Um, there will be other attendees I know online who are TV survivors, civil society organisations and grassroots advocates, and of course, TB and global health experts. So a warm welcome to you all. Uh, it's an important day for us all to be together. Uh, so thanks for joining us uh, to commemorate World TV Day this year. We again find ourselves in very uncertain times, uh, especially when it comes to global health. And now we're hoping that we are emerging from the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's clear how crucial the global TB infrastructure has been in our response to COVID and the tools and networks that were already in place um, to test for TB in the developing world so made it so much easier for um, access to COVID testing and treatment. The pandemic's also um, come at a very significant cost, it would have to be said, uh, in the fight against TB. In 2020, approximately 1.5 million people died from TB. And that number has risen for the very first time uh, in more than a decade, reversing what it's been just years and years of really hard work. So that is, uh, that is worrying. And at the same time, TB has become harder to detect since TB testing rates have declined 
uh, rapidly during the COVID pandemic as well. So we also know that um, TB has a disproportionate impact on people uh, in the Indo-Pacific region with the majority of the world's TB case, cases right here in our region. Now, uh, more than ever, there's an urgent need for, the, for a global, well-funded response to TB. And uh, this is reflected in this year's TB, World TB Day theme, which is invest to end TB, save lives. So leading the way is the Global Fund uh, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, which provides over three quarters of all international financing for TB. So a massive partner in this um, project. Since 2020, since 2002, pardon, um, the Global Fund has raised more than $50 billion and saved more than 44 million lives. So, you know, it is utterly um, unimaginable what our um, planet would look like without the Global Fund right now. And Australia's legacy with the Global Fund is, is one that we can be proud of. We've contributed just shy of $1 billion, uh, Australian dollars, to that fund since its inception, uh, which has helped to save lives in many lower income countries across the world. And that's, of course, the intention of the fund. Uh, we, you know, with all of that in mind, um, I am really delighted to be here today championing the fight against TB. And I look forward to working with my colleagues in the Australian TB Caucus uh, and others in the lead up to the Global Funds Replenishment event later this year. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Result Australia for organising today's event and the diverse group of speakers that you've been able to pull together. Um, I'm very eager to hear from speakers who are so utterly committed to tackling TB and uh, very grateful to hear from those whose lives have been impacted by this disease. Uh, when we work together, we absolutely get so much closer to ending TB and to continue to save lives. You know, that's the task before us. And I uh, really thank um, Results and everybody for joining us today and would love to hand back to you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, thank you for the very important work that you're doing and also, of course, for taking the time to join us this morning and to kick our session off. Australia's neighbouring countries have some of the highest rates of TB in the world. And over the last two years, healthcare workers throughout the world, and especially in our region, have been battling both TB and COVID-19, as we just heard from Sharon. This World TB Day, I've had the privilege of interviewing two people tackling TB in PNG, Aniba Koivaku and Millicent Anabi. Aniba and Millicent are peer counsellors with the Burnett Institute South Fly TB program in the Western province of Papua New Guinea. Aniba provides education and psychological support to TB patients and their families. Aniba was a TB patient who completed treatment in 2007 and before joining Burnett was also a TB treatment supporter with World Vision from 2017 to July 2018. Millicent became a peer counsellor with Burnett in January 2022. She has a background in hospital admin support and advocacy for people on TB treatment. Millicent completed treatment for drug resistant TB in 2021. I want to acknowledge both Millicent and Aniba as TB survivors and that our conversation begins with Millicent sharing her personal experiences of being diagnosed with TB. Can you tell us um, what, what was your experience of TB? I mean, what, what is it like to actually have TB? Um, I was first diagnosed with TB in November 2019. All right. Uh, after tests were done, my results were positive, which I had a multi drug resistant TB. <coughs> Um, after being told of my results, I was uh, lost in my mind. I was scared. And then I began to feel worried. And I felt ashamed also. After three days of treatment, I was seen by a counselor who spoke to me about TB, how it is spread, how long it would take to be on the treatment, and also the side effects. After the session with the counselor, I was settled. All right. During the course of treatment, I went through 
a lot of experience. To be unemployed with no form of income and to take medicine every day was a tough one. Another burden on top of me was to worry about my three school age children that I was taking care of. I was also discriminated whenever there were arguments involving me. But all these things stopped me from taking my medicine every day. My goal was to complete my medicine and get better. I took my medicines for 18 months and completed treatment on the 1st of April, 2021. That was last year. All right. Uh, as I went through my treatment, going through my treatment, and the COVID came into uh, in place. When it came in, we were there were some things that we were affected while going through the treatment. Like normally, we get our daily treatments at the treatment sites, but when the COVID came, in, we were completely stopped because of the lockdown. There was the lockdown in place, so we were given supplies that we were taking at home. Millicent, you spoke about feeling yeah. shame. Uh, when you had that positive test. Is that a common emotion? Yes. I was feeling ashamed because I had my families and my friends. I didn't know how they were going to think about me when I, when, if they come to hear that I was on treatment. Yeah. Thank you. And Niba, you continued to provide TB counselling and education during the waves of COVID-19 in PNG. Can you share how COVID-19 impacted the people on treatment that you were supporting and how the TB program adapted during this time? Most of the people were dying in other parts of the world. So it brought great fear to them and they were scared. And also <clears throat> uh, most of the patients were, were discharged from the wards because of COVID-19. They were discharged from the different supplies and going home. And the patients were also dis uh, was um, restricted from going in and out of the hospitals. Um, doctor will only see patients who have emergency issues. Um, on the review, on the review days, um, doctor doctor would only see fifteen patients in a review day. On Wednesdays and Thursdays, fifteen patients were um, were asked to to be seen by the doctor at the time. And Ibra, I know you completed your TB treatment a number of years ago and have work supporting people on treatment for TB since that time. How was your experience different to those people on treatment now in terms of support? Yeah, so in 2007, in 2007, um, when I first started my, when I, when I was diagnosed with TB in 2007, mid 2007, um, I was diagnosed with DSTB. And in those days I was taking um, loose doses, one uh, loose, pills, loose tablets, and I was taking 11 medicines, 11 tablets a day. Every day I would walk up to the clinic and get my medicines. And I took the medicines for six months. Um, and at the time there was no counseling support, no support at all, no counseling, no education done. All I was told was <clears throat> you take medicines for six months. And I just knew about taking medicines for six months. and no much support, no lunches today, no whatever support. The only people that supported me was my parents. They were very close to me. They, they supported me in a little way. And compared to today, it's a very big change that happened. When Melvision came in, when Bennett came in, a big change came about. Today, mm -hmm. patients have all the privileges that they have. They have food vouchers. They have lunch packs that have been provided. They have best counseling service. They have the best education that they need today. But in the compared to those days when I was taking treatment, nothing, no, no support. You've both spoken about your experiences with TB, including during COVID. How do you think we can better address both COVID-19 and TB simultaneously? Millicent, I'll start with you. All right, uh, because the COVID-19 has become a health issue, where as the TB was an issue also. So these two, if they can be both looked at at the same rate, at the same speed, if they can be both you know, taken care of at the same time, because now the COVID has come a health issue where the TB was the 
main and it was leading that DG was leading issue. But now we have COVID on board. We have to some like uh, look at the boat if it can be done that way. You've both told us that you feel fear and shame when you're diagnosed with TB. What are the other physical symptoms that you feel? For myself, um, I, w I had some stops, short of breath, and uh, I was coughing a lot. And then I realized that I lose weight. Just over time, I was just losing weight. So these were things that made me to come for a check. Thank you, Millicent. What about you, Anaba? Um, yeah, um, when I was also first diagnosed, I, um, I lost weight. I, lo I lo lost a lot of weight. I was coughing and just coughing and losing weight. And I couldn't walk a, a far distance. I would have um, short wind. SOB. So I was quickly brought to the hospital and then when I was tested, I was positive. Yeah, so these are some of the signs that happened um, to me. Physically. Thank you. Thank you so much to Millicent and Anaba for their time. I could have spoken to them both for a lot longer, but for this format, I want to recap on some important points. A TB diagnosis can have a huge impact on the lives and livelihoods of those affected by the disease, as we heard. Both Anaba and Millicent also talked about the profound impacts of COVID-19 on TB and the way that the TB program needed to adapt to continue providing essential services. But the final point I want to emphasise is that we also heard signs of immense progress. Anaba shared that when he had TB in 2007, he was left isolated and without support. But now, thanks to the work of organisations like the Burnett Institute and World Vision in collaboration with the hospital and government authorities, TB patients are offered counselling, food vouchers and better TB treatment and services. So over a 15 year period, tremendous progress has been made against TB. But our challenge now is to make sure that progress is not lost due to the impacts of COVID-19. Our sincere thanks again to Anibra and Millicent for sharing their deeply personal stories with us today and all of their colleagues in Daru for the incredible work that they do. Having heard about the realities of TB on the ground, let's now learn more about the issue of TB, including in our region, from parliamentarians committed to ending the disease. I'd like to introduce the Honourable Warren Ench, MP, Member for Leichhardt and Co-Chair of the Australian TB Caucus. Warren was first elected to Parliament in 1996, representing the Division of Leichhardt in far north Queensland. Throughout his parliamentary career, he served as Chief Opposition Whip Co-Chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for LGBTIQ Australians, Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia and Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. Warren has also been a strong advocate for mental health and tuberculosis. He's been co-chair of the Australian TB Caucus since 2014, and he's on the executive of the Global TB Caucus. Warren, welcome along this morning. You're recognised as a national and global leader in your parliamentary <coughs> advocacy on TB. Why are you so passionate about fighting this disease? Well, from my own personal experiences, uh, Jess, and thank you very much. And uh, I have to say, when I when I listen there to Annabar and Mill Millicent's stories, it really drives home uh, the impact that uh, this insidious disease is having uh, on so many people around the country and how much work we still need to do. But uh, in for my own personal case, uh, when I was only around about 12, 13, my mother contracted us contracted tuberculosis when we were living in a place called Concurry. And I can remember how it broke our family up. And I mean, we are fortunate in that we uh, we had my, my, my three younger siblings went to one um, element of my family. I stayed with my grandparents. My mother was in hospital for a year now uh, as she got to treatment. Now, after that, uh, as far as I was aware, I mean, I'd had my vaccination and uh, TB, TB was as far as I was aware, was just uh, had been dealt with. And uh, then I become aware of uh, some problems up in the Torres Strait. You know, I, I actually elect, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, represent an area within about four kilometres of, of mainland Papua New Guinea. And uh, <coughs> I started to hear <coughs> some horrifying stories <coughs> about what was happening on, on, uh, in Papua New Guinea. 
And I actually had the opportunity of, of traveling to Daru at one uh, in the early stage. And uh, I, I passed the, the there'd been a, a recent uh, bout of cholera and there was a lot of uh, graves there from cholera victims. But then we started to talk about TB. I had a look at what the facility was like at the Daru hospital and it was <coughs> appalling. I have to tell you, <coughs> if you didn't have TB before you went there, uh, you certainly would get it while you were there. Uh, the, the staff that were there were living in, in uh, unbelievable conditions. I, and I photographed a lot of this stuff while I was here. Yet they would turn up every day uh, in beautifully pressed uniforms and effectively go back to stuff that was just unbelievable, something that, you know, you would have thought should have been bulldozed. And there was a big sign there said, proudly sponsored by the Australian government, by DFAT. I could not believe it. I took a photo of that sign as well. Now, I, that's what started to get me interested in it because there was so much TB. The TB ward that had been sponsored by the Australian government um, didn't even have any, a fan in it, let alone an air condition. It was just open ventilation. And the one, there were several sitting in there. There was no linen or anything on the, uh, on, on the beds. And, and the lady that I sat and spoke to, uh, I found out later, had three days after I was there, she'd passed away. So... Then it started, I started to get incidences of it in, into the Torres Strait. And it ended up, there was one family where, where the, the, the daughter, the, the, the granddaughter, the daughter and the mother all passed away from tuberculosis. Doing uh, some investigation, we found that there was actually still a tuberculosis ward in Cairns, um, where I'm living. And uh, you know, most of the, most of the, the uh, uh, patients were from PNG. They'd found their way here. So that was where I become very aware of it. And then a chance meeting in Canberra with uh, uh, results, um, talking to Sarah at the time. And uh, I, when she came in to see me and, and, and raised the issue of, of uh, tuberculosis, I launched into her, you know, you, you're talking about it, but what about up here? And then, so it, then the tables turned, she recruited me. Oh, goodness me, that was probably 2012, 2000. And, 13, 12, it would have been 2012, 2013. And uh, I have been a disciple uh, of that advocacy ever since. And, uh, you know, since that point in time, we've had some amazing, amazing results and we've still got a long way to go. And I have to also acknowledge Sharon, Sharon Clayton, who I will be talking, if she hasn't already, be talking on this. Uh, Sharon's from the other side of politics with me, but this is one of the great things about our, the work that we're doing. We don't even ask people uh, from a political side what side of politics they're on. We just ask them, what's your commitment to TB? And I'm telling you, people like Sharon have been absolutely amazing. And this gives us a strength that we have from a political sense that uh, if we didn't have that, that, that commitment, uh, putting politics aside, um, we wouldn't have been as successful as we have been and as successful I as anticipate now that the COVID umbrella is slowly being lifted that we need to be to progress this because we've got some catch up to do. Thank you so much, Warren. Thank you in particular for sharing your personal stories about your mother and other people that you've met along the way. What would you say to emerging leaders and advocates about the importance of this issue and the role that Australia can play in ending TB? Um, look. It can be done. There's no question about it. Um, but we need to focus on areas like Papua New Guinea, for example. If we can overcome the challenges of getting the services out into these areas, then we're going to beat CB. There's no question about it. I think COVID has actually opened an opportunity that um, we haven't seen before in relation to the advocacy of TB. You know, TB came out from the closet, I guess. It was always the poor cousin of HIV and malaria, and that's where all the money went. And this is the reason we looked at establishing, you know, the, uh, the caucus. Um, the NGOs have done a fantastic job over an extended period of time, but we had to isolate TB. And that's what we've done through the caucus. You know, the establishment back in 2014, there were only about 15 parliamentarians. There were five, uh, five countries, I, 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 I believe. Uh, uh, I was actually at the time uh, stepped up for not only Australia, but for PNG. Um, we had the Philippines, Japan, and, and New Zealand. 
uh, look where we are now. It's, you know, we've got about 2,600 uh, 2, 2, members in the caucus or more, and we've got about 160-odd countries. So we've really raised the profile. But through COVID, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn there. You know, there's no question about it. The success of COVID treatment is because of the commitment to actually invest in it. I mean, there's a trillion dollars has been spent on COVID and we, we got a solution in a couple of years, you know, in dealing with this. Mm. We only need a matter of, you know, four, five, six billion dollars to be able to get the vaccine for, for TB. So in the overall scheme of things, it's very, very small. But both are respiratory diseases. And this is where I say to the young emerging leaders, this is where we need to continue to, to focus on this. Let's get into the pharmaceuticals uh, companies. Let's get the commitment from them that we can go mining, if you like, or prospecting through all of those uh, candidates that they had that may well have been uh, unsuccessful for COVID because that's how we've actually gone from 25 tablets and, you know, uh, injections every day for up to two years down to, you know, we're now trialling a single tablet for three months. There's an opportunity to do that. So that's where I would say to the aggregates, the other thing too, let's have a look at those areas where we've got the biggest burden. PNG at the moment, there is a massive void. And, and you know, some of those advocates that were there, Australians that I know are now back in Australia, but struggling to get back from the COVID, restricting them coming back, struggling to raise a few dollars. And, you know, we talk about what went into COVID, but, you know, some of these people that have been working in PNG, you know, they are desperate to get $100,000 to keep their advocacy going. I mean, overall scheme of things, it's nothing. But there are lessons there too, because I was very heavily involved in PNG with the treaty villages. That's the 13 odd villages from uh, West Papua through to, uh, to Sui, which is up near Daru. And uh, we, we or it was helped establish what they call a ranger program uh, there, which is uh, right through the villages, all local people that have been trained up. And it was through that network, we were able to get Everybody that needed to get vaccinated got vaccinated. It was followed up. It was, it was amazing. In fact, they were all done before <clears throat> the majority of the Torres Strait was done. And, you know, when you talk about the complexities of it, so when I look at <clears throat> what we've done in those treaty villages, mm. there is an opportunity again for you uh, emerging leaders. Have a look at the model that we have there. It works brilliantly. Uh, so it, it means that you're working in partnership, partnership with individuals that are coming in to actually give you the knowledge and give you the support to actually do this yourself in your own communities. And it works. And if we can transfer again that, those learnings from COVID and the treaty villages and then put them into various difficult, let's go for the difficult regions in, in, in places like Papua New Guinea, and start to get the, you know, get it out there in relation to DB. The Western, uh, the, the, the treaty villages was one of the most difficult areas we had to work in, and we, we've got a solution. It is absolutely brilliant now, and all of those uh, leaders now in the treaty villages, and they're, they're the range, of, there's a range of uh, young women, as well as men, and, and, you know, they're up for any challenge, and use that as a model to go to other places. The other thing is be persistent. Be persistent. Just keep hammering and hammering, single-minded on this, and you will get listened to. And use cases. You know, use cases. You hear cases there. We heard about Annabelle, Annabelle and uh, Millicent. Those sort of cases, we need to continue to put them out there, but also talk about our successes, where we are actually making things happen so that we know that this is not an impossible dream. It just means to say that we've got to work harder for it, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. I'm confident after COVID, I think we can accelerate the process for a, a vaccine for TB. I think that's a great spot to leave it. Thank you so much, Warren, for your time and for making the time to join us. But thank you, more importantly, for your passion and energy on this subject and for everything that you've done in, in raising awareness. Um, you are making a difference. So thank you so much. We know that uh, TB is not only a serious issue in PNG, but also in other parts of our Indo-Pacific region, countries such as Indonesia, the Philippines, India and Bangladesh, just to name a few, all face the challenge of a high TB burden. 
Continuing our focus on political leadership, I'd now like to introduce a short discussion that I recently had with the Honourable Professor MD Habib Malat, MP from Bangladesh. Like Warren, Professor Malat is a member of the Global TB Caucus. He received medical, quali medical qualifications from the Mimin Singh Medical College in Bangladesh and the Royal College of Surgeons in, of Edinburgh. He is also trained in advanced cardiothoracic thoracic surgery from Europe's leading hospitals and Harvard Medical School. Professor Malat was elected president of the advisory group on health of the Interparliamentary Union in 2015. Currently, he chairs the Bangladesh Parliamentary Forum for Health and Wellbeing. Professor Malat, can you share why you're a champion for TB? Why is this an important issue for Bangladesh? You know, in our country, about uh... We are about 3.6% population are affected by TB every year. And as you see that we're only 2.6% of the world population. So if you do it percentage wise, we have a high incidence in tuberculosis in this country. We are one of the most burdened country. You have eight, but one of the eight most burdened country in the world that's suffering from tuberculosis. And it's not only that, it's, it's a disease that suffers lifelong and also it creates a social impact in national development. So we are working on that and we uh, want to promote and eliminate tuberculosis from our country. We have eliminated many diseases from Bangladesh. We want to eliminate tuberculosis from Bangladesh as well. But in tuberculosis, each year we lost about 48,000. So the ratio, if you do that, you know, it's a much, much higher death in tuberculosis than COVID. But if you see, even this year, last year, we spent 125 times of uh, our health budget in Corona. But as you said, tuberculosis, we spent so limited budget that even you cannot imagine. Thank you, Global Fund, for helping us in uh, in tuberculosis. But the, during this during this time, we have some problem with uh, you know detection and also supply chain was disrupted, and the number of unreported case raises and drug resistant tuberculosis was raises. In light of the impacts of COVID nineteen, how important is investment in TB in your region? As you see that health is a global problem, everybody now realizes that. And nobody is safe uh, from the infection diseases. So we need to have given importance to the tuberculosis, of course, but other diseases as well. And if we increase the budget in the health sector in long term, it gives us the more impact and more financially viable that they, we, can, we can get more return from the health sector budget. So we think that during the COVID, there are few problems everywhere in the world. The number of undetected TB has gone more than 25% in our country. The drug resistance TB has a missing a, a, you know, contract for 30, more than 30%. And this sort of figure is uh, not helping us to take the country forward because we have high level commitment. We have also, the sustainable development goal we have we have to meet up a target but the at this time especially last two years we are not even close to the targets so we need to give more attention to the tuberculosis and we need to do more and more to eradicate tuberculosis from bangladesh as well as from the world my thanks to Professor Malat for his reflections. So let's now consider the solutions and practical steps we can take to tackle TB throughout our region and the world. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria is a partnership created in 2002 and designed to accelerate the end of these three diseases. The Global Fund has a proven track record with its investments saving 44 million lives. To tell us more ahead of its seventh replenishment event later this year, I'm delighted to welcome the Executive Director of the Global Fund, Peter Sands. Peter has been the Executive Director of the Global Fund since 2018 and a research fellow at Harvard University since 2015. Having grown up in Singapore and Malaysia, Peter received a first class degree in politics, philosophy and economics from Oxford and a master in public administration from Harvard. He served in senior roles at McKinsey & Co and Standard Charters PLC, 
as well as on various boards and commissions, including the UK's Department of Health and the World Economic Forum. Peter, it's over to you. Thank you, Jess, and good morning, everyone, and good evening from here in Washington, DC, where I am today. I do want to start by thanking the Honourable Warren Ench and the Honourable Sharon Clayton, the co-chairs of the Australian TB Caucus. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Professor uh, Minat. Honourable members of the Australian Parliament and Results Australia for their invitation to attend this special event. And this is World TB, TB Day. And I want to take the opportunity to applaud the Government of Australia for your ongoing support to fighting tuberculosis, both in the Indo-Pacific region and around the world. Thank you for your long-standing commitment to our partnership's mission. 20 years ago, the world created the Global Fund to fight what were then the three deadliest pandemics killing millions of people a year, TB, HIV, and malaria. And led by communities affected by these diseases, we fought back. And over the last two decades, the Global Fund Partnership has proved that when we work together, we can force even the world's deadliest diseases into retreat. Together, we have saved 44 million lives. And between 2002 and 2020, death rates from TB have dropped by 42% in the countries in where the Global Fund invests. But as you've heard from some of the earlier speakers, COVID-19 has reversed many of our hard-won gains. For the first time in the Global Fund's history, we saw reversals in key metrics across all three diseases. And the impact of the pandemic on the fight against TB has been particularly devastating. In 2020, we saw deaths from TB worldwide increase for the first time in more than a decade, fueled by a surge in the number of undiagnosed and untreated cases. The number of people being treated for TB fell by over 1 million. And in the Asia Pacific region, which has the highest burden of TB in the world, we saw new TB case notifications fall really sharply between 2019 and 2020. We haven't yet seen the full numbers for 2021, but I am anticipating that we will see an improvement, a recovery in TB case notifications, because many countries, including Bangladesh, have taken determined and effective steps to recover some of the ground lost in 2020. But sadly, I fear that we may see a further increase in deaths as people who got infected and weren't treated in 2020 succumb to the disease during 2021. So we are far from through the full impact of COVID-19 on TB. Yet it could have been much worse. Without the rapid and determined actions that took place across the Global Fund Partnership by civil society, by communities, by governments, by the Global Fund itself, by technical and development partners, it would have been significantly worse. For our part, the Global Fund acted quickly and at scale, providing over 5.7 billion Australian dollars, that's 4.2 billion US dollars to help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on TB, HIV and malaria programs and to urgently reinforce key components of systems for health. Of that funding, we approved about a billion Australian dollars to countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including 120 million Australian dollars to Indonesia and 38 million Australian dollars to PNG. One of the silver linings, I suppose, of the pandemic has been that it has been a catalyst for innovation. And we've seen this in TB, with multi-month dispensing of TB medicines, 
much greater use of digital tools to monitor TB treatment, provide consulting consultations, and also the introduction of what is called in India bidirectional testing, simultaneous testing of TB and COVID-19. Many of these innovations, which empower the people who are directly affected by the disease, will outlast the crisis and strengthen our fight against TB in the future. Last month, as just mentioned, we launched our seventh replenishment campaign. The Global Fund raises money on a three-year cycle. The last replenishment was hosted by President Macron in France in 2019. This replenishment will be hosted by President Biden in the United States later this year. For the seventh replenishment, we aim to raise at least 18 billion US dollars, that's 24, 25 billion Australian dollars, to fight HIV, TB, and malaria, build stronger systems for health, and reinforce pandemic preparedness. This is an increase of 29% compared to what we raised at the sixth replenishment. And this sharp increase is necessitated due to the catastrophic impact of COVID-19 on the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria. And actually, the largest increase in projected funding needs is for TB. Given the reversals we've seen, the estimates put together by Stop TB, WHO, our modeling group um, in partnership is an increase of 64% compared to the previous three-year cycle. With 18 billion US dollars, we could save 20 million lives over the three year period and cut the death rate from HIV, TB and malaria by some 64%. To put this in perspective, about two and a half million people a year die from the three diseases right now. By 2026, we could cut this to less than a million. A million is still too many but to get below that milestone would be an extraordinary achievement. There's also a powerful economic argument for investing to tackle TB. Global fund investments from a successful seventh replenishment are estimated to generate 120 billion Australian dollars in health gains. This is just for the Indo-Pacific region and direct productivity gains of 10 billion Australian dollars. And that's just during the three year period. To get back on track towards ending TB as a public health threat by 2030, the SDG3 target, we need intensified and increased efforts to prevent TB, including a renewed focus on finding missing cases and successfully treating all people with the disease, including the drug resistance form. We need to promote service integration, and we need to put great emphasis on quality care tailored to the needs of individual communities. We cannot afford to fail. Today, the work of the Global Fund Partnership is more important than ever. Increase in conflict, the displacement of people, climate change, new pandemics like COVID-19, demonstrate that it takes a coordinated global approach involving partners of all different types to tackle such formidable global health threats. I want to thank the Australian people for their contribution to date and their unwavering support to our life-saving work. Together, we have refused to accept that anyone, anywhere, should die of preventable and treatable diseases. And it's through a united effort that we will make the world a safe, people, a safe place from future pandemic threats and end the earlier pandemics of TB, HIV, and malaria for good. So now is the time to fight for what counts. Let's do this together. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Peter, for that fascinating and very powerful insight. And we very much appreciate you joining us from, from Washington. For our final session this morning, we'll hear a call to action from the results community. It's my pleasure to introduce grassroots advocate and TB survivor, Maddie Strawn, and the CEO of Results Australia, Nagaya Chorley. Maddie is a passionate advocate for global change. She has a degree in business and is currently studying postgraduate international relations and politics, while also working at Channel 7 in digital marketing. Nagaya has 20 years experience in human rights and has led several organizations across the globe, spanning refugees, youth development, and women's rights. Thank you so much, Jess. And Maddie, it's wonderful to see you this morning. Can you talk to us today about your experience with TB? Um, I'm actually sick at the moment, ironically. So I do apologize in advance to everyone if I start coughing or stuttering. Um, but when I caught TB, I was traveling at the time. It was my first time overseas. It really is such a crazy story. Based on doc what the doctors could work out, it had come from my time in India. But given how tedious it is to diagnose, which I'm sure you all know, we really couldn't be sure. Um, I didn't have any symptoms until I returned to Australia. And even then, it just started so mild. It was a cough that wouldn't break and it continued to progress over the course of a few months. Then it just skyrocketed so fast. I went from having a persistent cough to losing weight rapidly. That was definitely the biggest thing. I was coughing up blood. I couldn't eat and nor did I have the energy to live my life as normal. But the hardest part was how long it took to diagnose. I was in and out of hospital for months, chest x-rays, blood tests. I remember one time I literally spent an entire day in a doctor's office just doing random tests because they couldn't figure out what it was. Eventually we did, but by that point, there was damage to my lungs and there wasn't really much we could do other than a long course of medication. I was really lucky to not have to isolate or quarantine. I'm not really sure how that worked, but I think because it had been so long, I wasn't contagious anymore. Thank you so much, Maddie. And can you talk to us about how this inspired you to join results? So the biggest thing I took from the experience is that if it took so long to diagnose for someone like me, someone with access to private healthcare, living in an advanced city with loads of support, what would it be like for those who don't have that? I was also so lucky that all it took was six months worth of medication that I could access at a discounted rate through Medicare and checkups that I could access through Medicare. What about those who are less fortunate, you know? I was inspired to join results as they make leaps and bounds to close the gap and build a world where everyone can access healthcare. <laughs> this is the kind of advocacy that we need, especially right now. People shouldn't still be suffering or dying from TB, nor should they have limited access to healthcare in general. It's a human right, it's not a luxury. We really need to work to campaign these sorts of issues. And <clears throat> that's where real change starts. Health equity is so important. Thank you so much. And a final question, Maddie, you're doing really well. Um, is what do you hope to achieve this year with results as a global health advocate? So ultimately, as everyone has mentioned on this panel here today, COVID has taught us that global, global health affects us all and we need to address it and invest in it. I see this as a platform to give these issues voice and to raise with parliament, the media, to educate our peers, et cetera. <laughs> we are all interdependent at a global scale. From my own personal experience, I have realized it is so important that we all have access to treatments and vaccines to save and prolong lives. As I mentioned, COVID really has taught us a lesson <laughs> that we can now apply to global health in general at a larger scale. I'm really looking forward to working with my colleagues at Results to leverage these issues, especially on social media. That's something I'm really passionate about as I have seen how it can gain traction, especially over the last couple of years, which I'm sure you have all seen. Um, it's just, it's really beneficial in educating the youth and educating people in general on these issues. <coughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Maddie, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. It was a very personal story, so really appreciate your story, as well as, of course, Anibas and Millicent's this morning. Um, I think those stories really help us better understand the reality of what it means to get a TB diagnosis and to have treatment. I also want to extend our gratitude to all of our speakers this morning. Um, it's just been fantastic to see such strong commitment for the campaign to end TB. Um, from TB survivors to strong political leaders at home and, of course, right throughout our region.
there's no question that there's a growing and diverse coalition of people and organisations who are absolutely determined to bring an end to this devastating disease. As we've been hearing this morning, the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund coming up later this year is the perfect opportunity to invest to NTB and ultimately, as we've heard from Peter, to save lives. And of course, in Australia, we have such a proud history of funding to fight against TB. Of course, the Global Fund was established 20 years ago and since that time, Australia has pledged more than one billion. In addition to that, we've also given millions more dollars to programs in the Indo-Pacific region, including for product development partnerships like TB Alliance that make new TB products more accessible to lower income countries. And of course, targeted treatment programs in high burden countries, such as those run by the Burnett Institute, which we've been hearing about this morning in PNG. But of course, we know even with all of this incredible support that as we've been hearing this morning, COVID-19 has set us back. TB funding is more urgent than ever before. And that's why Results International, along with a whole range of civil society organizations, including the Pacific Friends of Global Health and the Global Health Alliance is calling on the Australian government to commit at least 450 million to the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund this year. We believe that Australia has the responsibility, but also the capability to really build on past investments and champion an end to this devastating disease. We believe that strong investment in the Global Fund is one of the best ways to support the Indo-Pacific region and of course the world to be free from TB. So my thanks once again to all of our fabulous speakers this morning and I'll now hand back to you, Jess. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nagaya, and thank you to Maddie um, for her incredible insight. Even with that cough, she did so well. I'd like to close this morning's proceedings by thanking all of our speakers who've contributed their experience and ideas today. A special thanks to the co-chairs of the Australian TB Caucus, Sharon Clayton MP, and the Honourable Warren Ench MP, as well as Peter Sands and Maddie Strawn and Nagaya Chorley for all addressing us today. Thank you, of course, to Aniba Koivaku and Millicent Anabi for their really, really personal and powerful stories. And the Honourable Professor MD Habib Malat MP for taking the time to share their messages with us. For those interested, the full interview with Aniba and Millicent will be available online at results.org.au soon. All parliamentarians and attendees who've made time in a busy week to take part in the events. Thank you to everybody. Lastly, there are around 50 locations across Australia that will light up red for World TB Day today. I encourage everyone to visit a location and help raise TB awareness. I think um, Maddie's point before about the importance of social media is, is not to be forgotten to really uh, drill into that younger generation. Please visit results website, results.org.au and go to the World TB Day 2022 page for more information. Thank you all for speaking and to our attendees this morning. Thank you for your leadership and participation on this really important issue. And thank you to Results International Australia, Secretariat of the Australian TB Caucus for organising this wonderful event. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody, and stay well. <laughs>